with Daily Clout, and I'm really honored. Um, we're turning into the Whistleblower Network. We're, we're really honored to have Simonike Godek uh, with us, who has become a kind of a, a sensation globally, not of his own choosing, by being very brave in speaking out against some scientific matters that we'll discuss. Welcome, uh, Dr. Simon, Simon, Ms. Dr. Godek, whatever you would like me to call you. <laughs> Simon, please. Simon, please. Listen up. Sure thing. So you and I uh, connected um, when you made a statement in a thread on Twitter that became very viral. Can you summarize for the people watching who are not scientists what the issue was that you were addressing? Yes, of course. Um, it was quite funny. I mean, I, I joined Twitter and I usually use it to get information, vitamin D and to post some stuff, scientific stuff, to um, explain to my followers. I think I had like 30 in the beginning of December. So I was asked by a friend, hey, um, there's this one paper of Jocelyn Corman um, addressing the PCR tests, and um, he knew that I was a, um, a editor of a journal, of a Springer journal. It's about aquaculture, so it's not even the field of virology, but... And so that's knew. a peer-reviewed scientific journal, just to jump in and explain. So, yes, I review too, but I'm also responsible for finding reviewers. So, right. scientists submit papers to the mm -hmm. journal. They mm -hmm. give forward to me if they are in my, my field, and then I look for reviewers, and I, I go through this process. So, I was told, look at this. Um, there is a paper. It was submitted on one day, and uh, two days later, it was online. Can you please elaborate? Like, okay, no problem. So I made this thread, I think it was like 20 posts, explaining um, the process of uh, peer review in a scientific journal, um, which then became viral, as you just said. Um, the, the fun part is a bit, yeah, I started with just a handful of followers, and uh, a couple of days later, I'm now at almost 5,000, which is a bit shocking. It wasn't my intention. It got big, and... Yes, and it's um, led to problems. <laughs> well, we'll get we'll get to that, but let's um, just drill down into what you said in the thread. For people who have not been following the controversy you were addressing, the basic issue, as I understand it, is that another peer-reviewed publication called Eurosurveillance was that the name of the publication um, has run a a paper um, by a very well-known German scientist which is the basis for global lockdown policies, right? In which it basically said, this is what's called the PCR test. Is that correct? And and it's right. And your point, uh, Simon, or I really prefer to say Dr. Goda because I want to stress your <laughs> credentials, but, you know, Simon, um, your point is that in ordinary circumstances, peer review, which is the process of um, experts in the field assessing a scientific paper, submitting, you know, clearing it or sending it back for changes or rejecting it, right? Uh, when you accept a scientific paper through the peer review process, it goes into a peer reviewed publication, which is the gold standard for scientific and academic inquiry. And your point in this thread, as I understood it, was usually for that journal, the process takes 172 days. And you're a statistician and you proved this, whereas in this case, it took one day uh, and that there were other conflicts. Tell me if that's a right uh, summary of the situation and, and go into more detail, please, about what was in your thread. Yes, it was it was quite correct. But you, you just said um, a publication, but it's a journal. So your servants is a journal, which is owned by, um, I think it's the European Commission. Um, so you can you can just take it online who funds the journal. So it's, it's a public journal. Um, and the authors of these of this paper usually published there and, and I think at least one author is also of the of the uh, part of the editorial board I mean it's fine I mean I also I also publish in my own uh, journal but then I make sure that there is another editor who takes care of the review process um, so I don't want to be biased so for scientists it's the most important thing to be unbiased and I think we see a lot here but we don't see unbiased science um, so what happened is that this paper got submitted to... Okay, what was the paper about, just before we go through that process? What did the paper say? It's about um, the PCR test. It defines the PCR test. It defines the PCR test. 
Um, I'm not a virologist, so I think I'm the wrong person to ask. I'm so sorry. I don't want to make a public statement here, but it defines the PCR test. Thank you. But the, I, I should just tell people who are not following the debate closely, the PCR test is the test you get when you're testing for COVID, right? And it's the basis of all of these reports uh, that we watch on the news in the United States and in you know Western Europe, certainly where it says um, cases are up by, you know, a thousand today based on these tests, which are the PCR test. That's my understanding. Um, okay, so go ahead. So the paper's about the PCR test. Go ahead, please. Exactly. And as you already stated, in 2019, the average period of time was 172 days. There are cases of rapid peer review processes. So in case something is super urgent, it can happen. So you can say as an editor, oh, it's super important. You contact some people and say, can you please speed it up? Okay. So this has happened. And I was also made aware that it has happened in the past, that there were like um, um, publications being peer reviewed in a rapid way. Um, so this is being used um, as a, let's say, as an argument. Um, but still, one day, so, you know, my third says, hey, we, we looked into this a bit deeper. So the peer review process as such, as the author cited another document, which wasn't online, until the day they submitted, until 8.30 p.m. So we know the minimum peer review time of three and a half hours, the maximum 27.5 hours. And we assume, so what happens is that the they submit the paper, the editor receives the paper, okay? Then the editor looks for peer reviewers. These peer reviewers get the, get the um, document. They go through the document, they check it, they read it, they give, they give a peer review report. So based on this peer review report, the authors have to adjust the publication. So obviously, what the journal states is that the peer review has been done, but they cannot make it public because they don't want to um, like break privacy rules. Mm -hmm. um, but still, I mean, then the, then the editor gets it back, then she had to make the decision accept. Then this accepted paper goes to the typeset and the typeset has to put it into the form of the journal and then it gets online. So this is the process and given the fact that there are that there were several uh, conflicts of interest in the paper which were adjusted in uh, last summer so I think it was in June or July and that there were obviously some other um, flaws but I can't go into this. I cannot judge it because I'm not part um, I'm not in the field of um, biology but there are um, there are scientists who claim that there are there were mistakes in the in the paper, and even the main author Drosten in another paper from Münchhausen, I think it was Münchhausen, <laughs> I know I think it's a syndrome, but at least from from another from another author, he stated and during the summer that this paper actually should um, is flawed. So Drosten himself. Well, his stated, own the author of the paper on which all of Europe's and America's lockdown policies and testing are based has said that his own paper is flawed. Is that correct? Um, yes, yes. And also, as you mentioned, I'm aware that there is something called the retraction report about this paper in which other scientists who are virologists or who are in the field of um, you know, immunology and virology identified multiple problems with this paper. Is that correct? They publicly said this should be retracted um, it's there are serious flaws in it. That's what you're referring to when you said other scientists have pointed out flaws, correct? It was them and others as well. Yes, it's correct. And others as well. And I, I cannot, um, no, I cannot judge this. So I um, I mean, well, I'm just, I report, judge it personally. just reporting. So you're not in that field. You can't assess that. But but I'm just giving background because we, you know, we here in this community and the world community want to hear from you, not just to understand the process of peer review, although that's important, not just to understand that under typical circumstances, a peer review paper takes 172 days. And in this case, it was one day. Um, I can tell you from having submitted and just had accepted a peer reviewed essay, it took weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks to get peer review. Um, I've been through the peer review process twice and it's taken, you know, weeks or months at, at, at minimum. Um, and, 
And that's necessary, right? Because it takes time for scholars and experts to evaluate a document and identify any serious flaws, you know, bring them back to the author, have them corrected, not corrected. So this was rushed through. Um, but people want to hear from you also because of the big picture of scientists being silenced around coronavirus related science, right? So we're mentioning that these other scientists who uh, issued a public uh, challenge to the paper and said there are serious flaws that should be retracted. Um, they have had, I will say, from my sources, professional blowback, harassment, um, you know, people calling their institutions, uh, people calling their relatives. Um, this is what I understand from my sources. Uh, and we also want to know more about what happened to you and your thread when you simply pointed out so neutrally as the editor of a, you know, a, a peer reviewed journal, what the normal peer review process is and that this paper um, zipped through what should be the normal peer review process in addition to highlighting possible conflicts of interest. So what happened after, it, so first of all, correct me if I've got anything of that wrong, or is that basically correct? Yes. Basically correct. Okay, excellent. Um, so what is your CV, basically? Like, who are you? You know, what are you studying? What university are you at? You know, what, what's your background that leads you to feel a sense of um, mission in uh, just calling people's attention to the peer review process? Are you a researcher? Um, yes, I'm a researcher at the University in the Netherlands in Wageningen. And uh, my field is aquaponics. And um, yeah, so I, I do stuff with fish and plants, and I've lately written a book for um, for Springer. Uh -huh. And, and Springer Chronic. Is, a, is the scientific publication of which you are a one of the editors, correct? Or you're yes, you're one of the journals. Springer has many journals, hundreds gotcha. of thousands of journals. And the good Springer, it's not the the Springer Company of Germany, which I always call the bad one. It's the good ones, the scientific one. Um, and I've written a book on aquaponics that almost has, after one and a half years, almost one million downloads. It's an open access book. Congratulations. Right. Thank you. I'm not writing the second one, <laughs> um, which will be published in approximately one year. And mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm um, leading as an editor the, um, the aquaponics um, section of, of the Aquaculture International Journal. So okay. I have insights there for one year now, and I've, um, I've led many review processes. Mm -hmm. um, and I also and, know the number, I know the reports of the journal, so I know how long it usually takes and of this journal too and of other journals, so I have the comparison and data, and of course uh, then I, I got a bit suspicious. Huh? Absolutely, and aren't you also, do you also have some background in statistics and math? I mean, it's part if you do your PhD, I mean, <laughs> you need this, it's, it's like, uh, it's obligatory, yes. Understood, understood. So basically you're someone with a uh, you know, years of experience in the world of academic publications in you, you, you know, from experience, from being hands on what peer review takes. All right. So you wrote this thread. Um, right now you're based in Brazil. Is that correct? You're doing research in Brazil? Yes, we have a project um, with Brazil. So that's why I'm here right now. Okay. Um, what happened when you published your thread, which, again, I can't stress how, like, in the world of post-enlightenment scientific inquiry and open public debate it is such a neutral thread you didn't call anyone names you called very conscientious sober attention to the peer review process and you did something that i think is very valuable which is as someone who's been both a popular journalist and an academic you explained academic processes to a broad general audience who really need to understand them in a medical crisis or a pandemic in which so many huge consequential decisions are being based on science, right? And we're having, seriously, we're having journalists, you know, be told in press releases what a peer-reviewed study says, and then they run with it, even if it bears no relationship to what the actual peer-reviewed study says. That's happened over and over with coronavirus. We're having 
public records uh, and data and statistics based on hospital admissions, death certificates, et cetera, not be made public. And we're being told, well, the experts say it's this. We're being told the experts say it multiplies like this or that children can kill their grandparents if they hug them. But the science is not presented to us uh, and, and we're not being helped to read the scientific papers. So to me, the fact that you step forward and said, look, everyone, this is peer review process and this is what didn't happen is very very, very important. So you, you wrote that. It was neutral in my view, very fact-based. And then what happened? Then the first, first thing that happened was that people pointed out, uh, you will receive a shitstorm. I was like, what? <laughs> what for? And, and they told me, yeah, the, the, the trolls of, um, they said literally the trolls, I wouldn't call these people trolls, but the trolls of uh, uh, Drosten and Goldmans. Drosten is like this uh, the professor of Charité in Germany and Goldmans is a professor from uh, Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And they will get you. Uh, and like, who are they in relation to coronavirus, these scientists? Uh, um, they're virologists. So, so they're, the the they're the ones who wrote the paper? They're the ones who wrote the paper? Yes, people who attacked me were mainly people who were co-authors of both of these um, scientists, okay? Right. And also people who are um, part of the fact checkers. So let's say the Dutch Snopes. Okay. Uh -huh. So these people right. attacked me heavily and uh -huh. I got messages um, like as, and we will contact your university. Um, if you don't, if you don't take um, this offline, we will, we will shit into your fish tanks. So the people knew about me that I do aquaponic. I mean, I took it with a smile, to be honest. I was like, hey, yeah, poop into my fish tank. It's fine. I mean, like you, you make yourself a fool here. Um, so I received these are people with names made threats like we'll shit into your fish tanks, which is, I would say, kind of a veiled threat. If not literally, they're not going to go after your fish tanks, but it's like kind of a threat. But these were anonymous trolls or actual humans with credentials that you were aware of? These were no anonymous um, trolls. I don't know. These are other scientists saying these things yes. to you. Exactly. Oh, my God. And people contacting you and saying, we will contact your university. That happened? This happened, and um, so my university got contacted. Wow. And, and um, how many contacts did your university get? Do you have a sense? I, like dozens? I don't know. I, I don't know, but I know it were several on Twitter, mm -hmm. and also they got, uh, they got reports via, via the email. Um, I don't know the numbers. I don't know the names via the email, but I know, of course, who did it on, who did it on Twitter. Um, and what happened is that I was informed that there is some kind of panic and uh, that um, I could have that, that my what I do could have an impact on the um, reputation. But it seems lost in translation, as we say right now, because uh, I believe my university, what they say right now. So what happened afterwards is they, uh, the people responsible, mm -hmm. they read what I wrote. Okay. So I was told, Simon, what you wrote is super objective. Uh, what you wrote is correct. We like the way you address stuff. And the way I would address, like address, like as in name calling and homonym, was not fair. How can we help you? So my university backed me totally. Okay. And they, they published a tweet. And um, they also backed me personally. And they said, whenever there's something going on, please call us. We will help you out. So I'm lucky that my university is backing me because I didn't say anything anything wrong. It was just it was just a rational, actually more or less boring explanation of a peer process. Um, but of course, other scientists don't have this luck. So I'm I'm aware that several scientists got fired or are about to be fired. Um, I'm not. Um, can you elaborate on that? But when you said other scientists got fired or are about to be fired, can you tell me more about that? I can't. I just received several messages on, on Twitter, but these people have to um, tell their story um, because I also don't want to mess with this. Um, I don't want to make it worse for them. But I've been told this and also two of my of my friends um, were in deep problems and one of them made it and the other didn't. Um, so there is coronavirus research. Yes. yes. Can you give me a general sense of what your friends were saying or addressing that uh, one of them survived and the other one didn't professionally? You don't um, have to I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to tell names, but one was involved in this review paper, okay, and the other one was posting um, critiques on the WHO, 
and uh, conflict of interest of, of specific authors on LinkedIn. And her LinkedIn got literally deleted. And um, yeah, <laughs> she got into other trouble as well. So um, she's lost a big of her income. So this is, this is what I heard uh, per source, um, first degree source. Um, and this happens all over the world. But in my case, it's, it's turning out fine, but I have to be very careful because people try to, people try to put someone, or like in case me, into a different yeah, position, you know? Um, so they try to frame me. So what happened to me, for example, is, hey, so you, so I was talking about the process and people don't like talking about my threat. So they, they changed the topic to, for example, the PCR test. And they call me a mask, the a corona denier, PCR test denier, whatever. And if I don't, if I don't answer, they say, bingo, gotcha. And so it's, it's really, it's really crazy. And it's very, it's very hard not to get framed. But as a scientist, I know how to express uh, my thoughts. And I always, I always have to say my Twitter account is private, so I have no single affiliation to my university or to whatever. Um, but people try to figure out who am I, and they try to discredit me. Um, until now, it didn't work, but I'm afraid that they might um, like put stuff out of context because Twitter has how many? 280 um, signs you can use. Uh, for a message and some lots i mean people you can misunderstand easily messages you put on twitter and this is a bit of a danger for yes. every scientist to express himself absolutely do you think your university is still getting contacted both by supporters and critics um yes uh, I'm, I'm i'm pretty sure um at least on twitter i see this yes um, but i don't care yes you know? well it sounds uh, like I mean, thank God for your university. It's Wa. How do you pronounce it? Uh, Wa. <laughs> right. Try to try to pronounce it as well, and you win a prize. Uh, but it's it's literally Wageningen how you would pronounce it. Wageningen. Wageningen. I, I I really want to commend them. I have to uh, sort of jump in and say when I, you know, met you, quote unquote, it was before your university issued a statement saying we will support Simon. Of course, we support open inquiry and um, at that point they were being contacted and there was this is not from you but my my sources uh, say that there was a lot of pressure being put on your university and it, that was when I wanted to um, be sure to interview you and I started to call attention to your plight and the plight of your university being contacted and that thread that I wrote about you reached 800,000 Twitter impressions um, and it, it reached scientists all over the world and people who care about science uh, as well as of course your viral tweet and what it, it clearly revealed the virality of this discussion is that scientists as you say all over the world are being intimidated, harassed, threatened, um, their universities, their employers are being contacted in a very systematic way in this case around challenges to the dominant narrative around coronavirus related research and policies involving lockdown. Um, that's what I'm seeing in this case, but it, it's not new to me because since um, May of last year when something comparable happened to me, because I was doing research that went against a dominant uh, narrative that had a lot of vested interests, um, I, I have looked at this phenomenon of academics being targeted. It happened to Dr. Michael Mann, who is the famous climate scientist, and it's happening to scientists all over the world, whether they're engaged in climate change, uh, in you know revisionist history as I was, um, but right now in a huge way around coronavirus research. And the, the bottom line I've found is that, believe it or not, there are contracts that um, like private you know, PI firms like Black Cube, people are hired to smear the reputations of influencers, including scientists, and they do it, and, and, and this has become a modus operandi, especially on the right, or especially from, like, deep, deep-pocketed interests, like fossil fuels, for instance, in the case of Dr. Mann, but they hire teams to send out bots so a lot of the people who are arguing with you on Twitter are bots, I'm sorry to tell you. There are tools you can use to identify this. Troll farms, these are people who have no beef with Dr. Simon at all. They may be in the Philippines or in Croatia, but they're hired to 
taunt you, take your words out of context, go through everything you've ever said on Twitter, you know, find something to, to distract people with about you, find out things about your personal life. Now, I don't want to scare you, but like my personal life, all of us, you know, we're under this kind of scrutiny and, um, and they also contact one's employers and publishers. And this is happening all over the world. I'm actually in the middle of it right now, again, um, and it's it's very concerning and we need to speak out about it, which is one reason I'm so glad you're telling people about the harassment that you're facing. A lot of us feel very alone um, and don't want to say I'm being harassed. I'm being like cyber stalked. Basically, I'm you know, my my employers being contacted, my publishers being contacted. But I do think people have to understand that this is happening to scientists and academics around the world. And I've never seen anything as systematic as the attacks and intimidation being aimed at scientists who are challenging the many, as it's turning out, many faulty research papers, badly spun, you know, media summaries and inadequate data around the coronavirus situation and its lockdowns. Um, so I just wanted to say that. So thank God that your university did the right thing, but I think it took a lot of people I think universities have to be contacted by supporters of free speech, um, you know, to help them stay strong because they can get pressure from, you know, heads of state. They can get pressure from funders. They can get pressure from donors in private systems. So we are we have to recognize we're in a war right now and it's a war to save the enlightenment and to save scientists and science, you know, and free inquiry and academia, you know academic expression being free. So having said all of that, um, what are you planning to do now uh, to, I mean, you've kind of turned into an inadvertent spokesman for scientific openness and the right to even criticize bad science around coronavirus. Um, what what are your next steps, Simon? Um, always been like this. Before I wasn't, I wasn't that famous on Twitter, but I like to, what I like to do is I, I like to take papers, publications, and just break them down to the um, essential message. So I did this before with um, aquaponics, nutrition, vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids, and I like to make friends and, and just explain both sides. So their, their papers pro and, and, and anti-vitamin D3 and just explain um, the, the respective studies and even go into the methodology. Um, last May, I've debunked uh, fake D3 papers from Asia. They got like hundreds of citations. They were totally in favor of D3, but we debunked them as fake. So right. it's not like that that I'm biased. I try to be unbiased. Of course, it's always right. trying because as I have my personal opinion, I have my I have my personal view, and every person is biased to some degree. But as a scientist, you have to try to be unbiased. You have to try to to see things from a neutral perspective. And this is what I will continue to do. I will continue to look into things. I will continue to look into issues that I understand, be these peer processes, or is this a big data analysis, or, or be this um, my field, you know, of, of, of nutrition and D3. Right. I, I'm so glad to hear you um, committed to continuing to explain to non-academics, non-scientists what scientific papers say I think there's such a need for it and if our platform can have you back as a regular commentator anytime you want we'd love that Le before I let you go um, is there other bad science you're aware of in relation to especially the coronavirus research and the pandemic response um, are there other studies that you think are being misunderstood numbers that are not good um, is is there anything else you see that doesn't hold up or that requires, I should say, more investigation? That so is what I'm awesome. aware of, um, the authors of this restriction, um, retraction paper, uh, review paper, um, they are publishing today or tomorrow an addendum and where they look into other publications too. But this is a set of my field, so I cannot, I cannot judge it. I can just say that this just is going to be published. It's just going to be super. Exactly. Right. They will explain, I already read it, they will explain um, processes of other papers and why things could be biased, why things are not properly done, um, which is which is interesting. But of course, it needs people from the field to judge this, and mm -hmm. this is what I'm a bit missing. I think people in the field they are a bit maybe they are afraid or intimidated to speak um, out to the public. But I mean, it's who who am I to judge? Um, mm -hmm. What I can do is just talk about what I understand um, and also. Um, Look into look into issues that I I'm aware of 
and um, and make them public. And as I said, Twitter, my Twitter account is my personal account. I can I can express my personal opinion. But of course, now after I get all this uh, attention, I have to be a bit careful too because I don't want to be framed. I understand. Well, it's a sad day that pure research scientists and physicians um, and people who are engaged in the pure pursuit of truth have to weigh their words and have to get media training to avoid being framed or taken out of context. It's a sad day uh, that the visible attacks on scientists who dare to make what before this pandemic were absolutely normal scientific critiques, normal back and forth of enlightenment processes are, are, are needing to, you know, get like PR advice and back up from their universities and, and, and kind of make sure their physical safety is okay in some cases and that their relatives are being contacted. And what I really see, uh, especially around the issue of coronavirus research, is that, as you mentioned, it's, it's taking courage now for doctors and scientists and journalists to simply come forward with objective information or normal critique of the received um, kind of narrative line uh, around some of these studies and, and the attendant policies, which are becoming, you know, very visibly um, unsustainable as more and more scientific papers come out saying things like, well, there's very little evidence for asymptomatic transmission or, you know, in the case of the research I've been doing on uh, dashboards, you know, the, the raw data sets, well, you're a statistician, the raw data sets for the dashboards that keep reporting deaths from coronavirus and infections or cases, whatever that is, are not public. You have to FOIA them. You have to get a Freedom of Information Act, um, you know, request to even see the raw data sets. That is not science, right? That's exactly. not and you have And you have many journalists who are very biased in picking studies. So that's what I see. I mean, I've read many studies and I can just see which one I picked. And also between the scientists, the dialogue. So you have you have a, a scientific dialogue. It used to be very respectful. Now it's yeah. toxic. Toxic. Um, so yeah. it's, it's things are things are turning black and white. So the gray zone is shrinking. And this is what I'm what I'm concerned about. And you're exactly right, because doesn't good science and the eventual emergence of truth only emerge from respectful dialogue, open dialogue, and often from the gray zone, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Not to put words in your mouth. So basically, it, it seems like this intimidation of scientists and this cherry-picking of science by journalists is re really risks closing down, or it's already happening, open scientific discussion and um, the kind of open exchange and academic freedom that in the past led to scientific development. So we're really at risk of killing science right now, right? And killing the emergence of things that could keep us safe and inform us and teach us about how the world works as a human species. Is that too much to say? I wouldn't go so far um, because I think killing science, I mean, there are many fields of science which are not affected, okay? Um, but of course, um, science getting more biased. I'm afraid of this. And um, that's why we have to support unbiased science in all fields. And also in this field, that people look into this, that people are unbiased when looking at data. Um, and this has to be part of the society. This is, this is what Wagner actually said, like, guys, we are you're behind unbiased science. And this would also want to, to hear from politicians that it was what I want to hear from biologists. And there are many biologists in the world who say, hey, there is something going, um, going wrong. Uh, but they are not heard or hardly heard. So when I when I open the newspaper, um, or nowadays you you <laughs> you, go, you Google the newspaper, right? Mm -hmm. um, you you what you read is is pretty is pretty one sided. So it's not back in the times that they used to um, look into both sides of the story, and, and now it's a bit it's a bit too biased in, in my opinion. Um, also, when when addressing this paper, I was I was talking about. So um, of course, I was I was googling um, a one day peer review, and I haven't I haven't found any 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 newspaper addressing this. And I'm just imagining um, the other side. Just imagine the other side would like the side of, of Corona critics huh? um, would would publish a paper um, within one day. Everybody would talk about this. So I'm a bit concerned how things are um, addressed and how they're communicated. But I don't want to judge anyone. I don't want to um, judge any journalist. But I think everybody should should try to um, get like less emotional and 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 look into issues more rationally. 
Right. Spoken like a true scientist. Uh, Simona K. Godek, Dr. Simon, thank you so much. From your mouth to God's ears, as my grandmother would say, um, to the ears of other universities, other academics, other scientists, and certainly to us who are grateful as lay people for your um, illumination, your courage, and your explanations. Please come back another time. Thank you so much. This is Naomi Wolf. And everyone, if you want to speak to Dr. Simon, where do they find you? Um, they can find me on Twitter. I okay. just put my name underneath your, your video and they can find me there. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. Stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.